is what I've learned 40 years into life. What is coming for you is coming for you. And so you have an opportunity right now with somebody that you love to look at yourself in the mirror, get feedback, make change, maybe sign up for a therapist, like really address the trauma. As somebody who was a toxically masculine feminist for a while, and I don't know any other way to put it, because I was like, raw, raw, feminism, go! Women can do whatever! But I also, um, like, hated women and competed with women and tried to other myself from like the feminine women because I never wanted kids didn't even care about getting married really well more I didn't think I'd ever meet a man who would make my life better <laughs> so I didn't see a point I didn't want the things that I'm supposed to want and that a lot of women that I, you know in in general seem to really want and so I othered myself like fork all y'all I'm not like you and so I went very far in the other direction so I wrote about it for Outside Magazine several years ago. If I were to write this again, it would be a very different article because I've unpacked so much more since writing this. But this was when I was a cool girl. And part of this was a trauma response from childhood. And part of this was also just adapting to working in a very toxic world with men. The outdoor industry, as liberal and leftist as it is, is full of like misogynistic dudes in ponytails who talk softly but still hate women. <laughs> And some who don't talk so softly and don't hide it so well. But I was tough. I wanted to be tough. Like, I've done videos on this before. But I went too far down that route. And in doing so, I became hyper-individualistic. I became like a lone wolf. Now, unlike men who do that, I was not a parasite. In, in, like, I didn't date somebody and exploit their labor and do all the stuff that a lot of men who are like that do, right? Any woman who knows climbers and all the guys who are like, ah, free spirits and stuff, they'll still date you. They'll still use you for your body and your emotional labor and all that stuff. They'll still store their gear in your garage, right? Like, they will exploit the crap out of a woman while also not fully committing to her. I didn't do that. I just didn't date at all. Because I also don't have the power structures behind me to be able to exploit someone else and... I don't, hopefully wouldn't want to, but you never know, right? We're all raised in this system. But having worked with so many men and lived among men, shared tents with them in the outdoors for weeks at a time, and just being in this very, you know, hyper-masculine world where the men are all pretending to be men, like, pretending, sorry, not to be men, but to be, they're all performing masculinity. And then opening up to me alone sometimes because they can't talk to each other, right? Being in that world for so long and also coming from a place of a lot of childhood trauma at the hands of men and having not dealt with that yet, I ended up being very much like a lot of men. These lonely men and their lonely men crisis. But unlike a lot of men, I realize this is not sustainable. This actually sucks. I don't want this. And so I not only went to therapy a lot, I've literally like for like what, I don't even know, 20 years now? Like half my paycheck? That <laughs> goes to therapy. That's why I like lived in a trailer with no running water. Like I have invested so much money in trying to heal all this schmegual trauma and all the violence of men and just all the other stuff, right? It's not always just men who like do bad stuff, but you know, I had a lot of predators and stalkers and old men and all kinds of crazy stuff in my life, right? So, but I've been working hard because I don't want the fate of the road I was heading down. By the way, that's my mutual. I love following him and I also love following his wife, Jamie. And one of the reasons why I love following them, I don't, you know, I'm not, it's not like a parasocial relationship. It's more like the reason why I talk about my story, I talk about my husband, and I like following pages like that as well as a whole, you know, variety of pages. It's because I will never be like, oh, like men are just like, boys will be boys. Men are just like helpless. That's what they want you to think. They want you to think they're not capable of growing and changing and emotional intelligence and all the stuff that we need them to do in order to be in relation with us in a healthy way. I know they're capable of it because I have male friends who are like that and my husband is like that. I would not have married a man who was not like that. Somebody I could talk to, someone who I could trust, who I felt respected by, someone who saw my humanity, someone who would be brave enough to be honest with me, but always thoughtful in his delivery. Somebody who could anticipate my needs the way I anticipate his, right? Like we know those of us who've known men are capable of this are basically being like, uh, the gig is up, the jig is up, whatever it says. We know men can do this. Not many men are doing it but they can. And if they're not doing it, it's because they just don't want to. And it's because they're cowards. It takes a lot of courage to 
to not get defensive when someone calls you on your crap. And as a white woman, I know what it's like to be so full of shame when you realize that you are um, collectively a very dangerous person. So that's one reason why I don't have a whole lot of sympathy for men when they're just like, no, I can't look at, you know, and they get all defensive. Like I understand where that defensiveness comes from, but I just see those, uh, those men as cowards. It takes a lot of courage to face the truth in yourself, the truth in your ancestry, the truth in how you've played a role in so many things that you wish you had not played a role in or enabled or even believed in despite me not choosing what I was taught. It takes a lot of courage to sit with that discomfort and look at it and then do something about it. And men who refuse to do that, that's why I don't really have much empathy for them. Like I get it, I have some empathy. I guess I don't have much patience for their BS in that I'm, I'm not gonna enable them anymore. I'm not. And their day is coming. Just like I saw my day was coming being someone so afraid of relationships. And I don't mean just r romantic ones. I'm glad I did not date for mo all my 20s and most my 30s because that's how I became the person that I am. I wasn't hijacked into a relationship with some toxic dude who made me center him. But not only did I, my, my female friendships, especially my friendship with my friend Liz and a lot of my mentors have shown me how to open up, how to be vulnerable in a good way, like a safe way, not like an oversharer, <laughs> give you all this information so like you an abuser or narcissist can use it against me kind of way, right? A vulnerability is not always a safe thing to do. So I came across this photo yesterday and it reminded me of how far I've come. A lot, a lot of the feedback that I got from people in my life who love me and from mentors and people who had what I wanted was, for instance, my sister told me that if I want a relationship with my nieces, well, I only had one at the time of this picture and this is her right after she's born. She was like, I know, you know, I know that you want to be a great aunt and everything, but you have to do the work now. And she explained to me that, you know, that like I envisioned me being like, you know, so close with my nieces once they're teenagers. And then I'd be like Aunt Jackie from Roseanne, right? Minus being a cop where, you know, like they would come to me for advice, they would tell me things they're afraid to talk to their their own mother about or their parents about. You know, like that I would be that safe adult for them. That and 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 I don't want kids, but I love being an aunt. And she's the one who said, if you know, you have to put in the time now. And I hated babies, y'all. I was like, every time I'd hold one, I'm like, eh, right? Like, ah. Uh. It was like an ongoing joke. Oh, Melanie's gonna hold the baby, right? Because I didn't think I had a nurturing bone in my body, but I wanted a relationship with those kids. And so I flew to Florida as much as I could afford to go do the FaceTime with them. And you know, like, I mean, those trips are exhausting. Anyone who is like the fun aunt or fun aunt, uncle knows that when you are on, you are on. Like, you know, it's like doing like, it was like doing like five days of a one woman show, right? Like, blah, 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 especially when they're young, especially when they can't talk, you're just making silly, blah, like it's, it's, it, it's so tiring. And then once you start that, that once that's the standard, that's how it always is. I never, like I can never just relax because they're like, Melody, do something funny, right? Uh, I hated being around babies. I found it enraging to be around toddlers. And part of that was because of my own lack of healing around my own childhood trauma, which that has, you know, dealing with that has helped my relationship with children in general. So if you really hate kids, maybe it's about your own past. I don't know, just a thought. But I just did it. I did it anyway. I spent so, all my, my, whatever money that I wasn't spending on therapy on going and investing time into those kids. So they felt special, so they felt loved, so they knew I was gonna be there as much as I could. I've flown across the ocean to go see them. I will do as, as much as I possibly can, I pour into, that, into those girls. I send them videos of me just doing stuff, you know? Just, just so they know I'm thinking about them. And I love these kids so much, and they love me so much, and that's because I was willing to listen to feedback. And the same thing with my husband. He was like really uncomfortable around kids when we met and I told him exactly what my sister told me. And he used to just kind of like tap out and you know, just like was just kind of more reserved. And then he switched and he started being actively present in their lives, constantly getting up, constantly entertaining him, constantly taking the lead. Those kids are obsessed with him now. My, my, my niece and my nephew, they love him so much. Why? Because he was listening to feedback, humble enough to take it in 
and willing to change. And like me, he's enjoying the fruits of his labor.